All right, guys, welcome to the show. I hope you sat there, you know, either fucking scantily clad or dressed in your World Around You branded clothing. If you're not, go to worldaroundyou.com, order yourself a T-shirt, listen to these shows, and then come back to these shows when you've got your T-shirt and listen to the show in your T-shirt. Anyway, I'll let you crack on with the show. All right, guys, I'm the World Around You, and this... This is Pause for Thought on Threshold FM. And this week, we're going to be almost topical. The The date as I've made these notes is the uh, is the 10th of November, but it's actually today that I'm recording this is actually the 15th of November. Just for, you know, transparency and that, because that's what we're all about here. We just, it, the truth is very important to us all. Maybe not as important as it is on truth seeking, but the truth is very important over here. So, and at Threshold FM, all we really care about is, is the truth of everything. So, I made my notes on the 10th of November, but I'm, 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 I'm recording this show for you on the 15th of November, uh, which is. Works out about maybe four days after no six days. It works about about six days. Done it after the uh, the anniversary of the twin tower attacks over here in the UK. So, I mean that's got nothing to do with the story at hand in it. But scientists have recently come out and said that penguins might be from a different planet in it. And this was brought to my attention actually on the Threshold FM Discord in it. So if you if you're not on the Threshold FM Discord, go and go and find that. It's on the Threshold FM website. So that'll be on you know, threshold.fm, but I'm, I'm going to imagine you know that if you're listening to this. So, anyway, I, I, I was I was surprised, and it, I mean, not surprised to find out that penguins are from, from space, but I was shocked by it because a couple of years ago, when my head went for a little while, in the sense of it went all a bit, um, let's call it wobbly, I, uh, I was in one of my little holes, and I compiled loads and fucking loads of notes about uh, lots of different types of animals, um, rate, rating them, explaining, uh, basically, yeah, it was like a manifesto for the, the reason why we should go to war with creatures, basically, and, and, and I feel better now, and it's a few years down the line, and it was, it was weird, because when I looked into, um, a very particular type of penguin, and some of the notes actually led to making notes on two different types of penguins, one I already knew quite a lot about, which was the Tuscumbian space penguins, and uh, another one, another species of penguin was the uh, the Gen Two penguin. Not to be confused with the with the Gen One penguins or the, you know the the more recent Gen Three penguins, which have um, came out in about two thousand and seventeen. But now the the two seemed almost completely interchangeable, innit? Like you could just replace the stories with or. In Tuscumbia, the the farmer saw a bunch of Gen Two penguins, and and maybe you know maybe they're called Gen Two penguins because the original ones were from a uh, uh, very far off planet, let's say, and they arrived there in the spacecraft as described in the story of the Tuscumbian space penguins, and maybe that's why so called scientists, like not like scientists, but the 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 scientist type of type of science, you know that type of type of scientist, the taxonomical people, you know, who wanna who wanna tell us that aliens aren't real and that fucking dinosaurs aren't all made in factories in China, them sort of scientists, the bad scientists, they might have taught, thought we can call them the Gen Two penguins for a laugh because obviously the original generation of penguin was an asylum seeking penguin that came here and now these are the second generation penguin on Earth, but. I've dug out my old notes anyway, and, and the pages from that very, very special book that I started writing and should probably never get to see the light of day. And, and we're going to look into that this week. And, and those of you that were in the Discord last week for the show, uh, as it went out, might recall that... Uh, well, not last week, but the, the last episode, if you was in the Discord for that, you might actually recall Jimmy Budd, the uh, comedian and host of Chart Topping Show, Truth Seeking, was very dismissive of the way that I do research, claiming that... I only try to back up my own ideas and never try to disprove them, so I thought it might be nice to see if my independent research built on nothing more than paranoia and a lifetime of um, what a doctor has called a night terror um, holds up t- t- compared to what actual scientists, like scientists, quote-unquote, that, that seem to claim the exact same thing as me. So, first, what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to go into what I have found, you know, a, a couple of years ago. I've gone, I've gone through my notes on that and put them together. And then we'll see what these scientists have discovered and we'll see how close I was. And I would just like to point out that I think I think these, these scientists that have discovered 
Um, the new stuff about penguins being from outer space, this this new science stuff here, they're, they're the proper scientists, innit? And they're not the sort of scientists that we do like to disregard and discredit here in this very particular hour of Threshold FM broadcasting. But first, let's have a song. This is um, this is Method Man's new song with Iron Mike. It's called The Last Two Minutes. So, getting into it, the Gen 2 penguin is a sub-Antarctic dwelling species, a penguin that does have quite a few questionable tendencies. Almost, some might say, uh, it's as if they're entirely new to being penguins. For a start, they don't show any solidarity at all in their behaviour because they'll happily nest on a shoreline or a couple kilometres inland away from the sea if they feel like it. And they'll also, you know, up sticks and move if the grass they, they live around gets trampled, you know, where they're currently living. Almost as if they care about what it looks like. Almost as if they're just little people in little costumes. Or the or the they're sentient of some sort or or they have a they have a care for what would be what we would consider interior design, but that interior design only works when it's inside. So, for what we're going to dub exterior design. Now, standing at 90 centimetres tall, which is nearly, well, around about three foot tall, so that's almost a metre tall, which is almost the height of a person, right? They could be very little people, innit? Very little people that enjoy paying for sex with other very little people. Now, this isn't to say, you know, like, fucking... They're, they're, they're little people, or, like, their children trying to have sex with other children. We're not going down that line, like I say. This this isn't truth-seeking, you know. Uh, male Gen 2 penguins, they're, they're known to collect pebbles and exchange them as currency for sexual favours from female Gen 2 penguins. And, obviously, you know, just to keep the SJWs happy, I am very sure... Well, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not basing it in any form of um, science or from my notes. But neither do SJWs. They they don't do it either. But let's pretend that there's some male Gen Two penguins who collect pebbles and exchange them as currency for sexual favours with other male Gen Two penguins, just to keep everybody happy. Let's have a few. Let's have a few gay penguins in there now. But though this means that that's not important. The, the, the sexuality of these penguins is irrelevant because what it does mean is that these have a, a single currency. Almost their, their entire race is using one currency, right? Something that the New World Order has allegedly been trying to achieve for decades. Now, with this currency to be floated on the market, one's going to have to assume that it's going to be at an exchange rate of about £40 per pebble. Now, this is based in research. I've, I've deduced this by researching prices for sex from prozies, uh, only in the UK, mind, you know, I, I'm not going travelling for this. It's, it was expensive enough as it was. And now, with some acts not being possible with penguins, such as, you know, like a hand job, which would be about a tenner, and a blowy, cause, um, which would be about 20 quid, you know, because fucking penguins have flippers, not hands, and they've got beaks, so it probably wouldn't give the right feel to a penguin's pecker. Meaning, each stone must be equivalent to around 40 quid, but... What do the females spend these pebbles on? Right, that's the that's a big question there, isn't it? Now it turns out, fuck all. They they literally just invest it into the homes and into the children. Nests are fashioned from these pebbles. Very strong, sturdy, uncomfortable nests. Almost as if these Gen 2 penguins have no homely or earthly instincts for comfort at all. Now, I find it very concerning how they are bothered by a disturbed grasses around them, yet not by sitting on cold, frozen stones. Now, you could also view this storage of currency as a way of the females controlling the population. They only accept certain stones, much like a bank would, except these penguins are both sperm banks and high street banks all rolled into one. They could use their currency to effectively cripple all of ours all around the world. A system that doesn't give change, everything's done in integers of 40, is fucking mental, me. But where has this obsession with stones come from? And why are they so dangerous? Now, I've managed to place the Gen 2's obsession with stones back to Valentine's Day, you know, which would account for why penguins are seen to be somewhat romantic, given the stones, you know, and its exchange for sex. And it was a very particular Valentine's Day. It was Valentine's Day 1967. And we can even pinpoint it to a farm in Missouri in America. And the man to blame 
a Mr. Claude Edwards, a cattle farmer who declared intergalactic war by literally casting the first stone at a group of similarly described penguins in one of his fields, in an incident that's now known all around the world as the Tuscumbian Space Penguins. Intrigued uh, by his cattle's eastward gaze, as he called it, he inspected a neighbouring field to find a bunch. Now, I, I imagine a bunch would be, I'd say, somewhere between sort of five and ten, because you normally get like uh, like a bunch of bananas is like six, five, six bananas. Uh, I mean, a bunch of grapes is a, is a lot of grapes, but it's also, you know, there's going to be about ten main stems on a bunch of grapes. So around, and then we're talking about, you know, we're talking about penguins from another planet, so they're not going to bring fucking loads here. I don't think it was an invasion as such, but it was just, let's say, between six and ten. Now, these were greyish-green creatures, maybe about three feet in height, which, again, 90 centimetres, same as a Gen 2 penguin, with arms move, that seemed to make him move so quickly that the hands was it were invisible. Now, just a quick side note, he thinks their hands were moving that fast, their arms were moving that fast, they couldn't see their hands, but what if they don't have hands? Because they're penguins. See, no one's considered this. Now, these creatures were also accompanied by a mushroom-shaped structure which they later climbed into and escaped in. Now, it is worth noting that they had touched down in Missouri during an icy period, so maybe they needed to scout for a cold location to settle down in. Now... What we're going to do is we're going to have a quick comparison. I'm just going to get me a... I wrote up a little table for this bit. I'm going to just going to get that up. Give us a second. So what I've done throughout the, the whole note-taking for all of this is I've made little tables and comparison stuff. But this one here, this is... I'm com we're going to compare the Gen 2 penguin to your average Tuscumbian space penguin. Now, the Gen 2 penguin, as I keep telling you, is 90 centimetres tall on average. And the Tuscumbian space penguins were measured at 3 feet tall. Now, a Gen 2 penguin has a black beak with a red line. A Tuscumbian space penguin had a black beak. Gen 2 penguins, black and white plumage. Tuscumbian space penguins, grey and green plumage. Gen 2 penguin obsessed with pebbles. Tuscumbian space penguin was gifted two stones. Gen 2 penguin adapted to cold and harsh weathers. Tuscumbian space penguin adapted to a life in cold, empty space. Gen 2 penguin, fast swimmers of all penguins. Tuscumbian space penguin, used to moving in weightlessness. So there's your little comparison there, you know, they've got quite a lot in common. Now, I know there's a bit of a difference between saying that a Gen 2 penguin's got a black beak with a red line and a Tuscumbian space penguin's just got a black beak, but from the distance that, um, from the distance Claude was observing the Tuscumbian space penguins, it's easy to, uh, you know, imagine he couldn't see the red line in the beak. Very easy, you know, we can let that go. Now, the, the grey and green plumage of the Tuscumbian space penguins, that's a little bit harder to describe away, but, you know, these, you, can't have, you can't have five out of five, you know, or however many was that, that was that, that was six out of six uh, comparisons there, which were quite quite close, and it's still two colours, isn't it? It's not like, and the grey and, and green, still very, very similar to black and white, realistically, because... How how grey is grey? Yeah, a grey could be very close to black, could be very close to white. Green, it, it's night time. You might not be able to tell. It could be a very light grey and a very dark green. Do you know what I mean? There's no there's no photographs of them, and you'll be hard pressed to find a photograph as well of a um, of a Gen two penguin where it shows that you know everything that's here. Like, how do you take a photograph of a Gen two penguin that shows they're obsessed with pebbles? Photographs aren't everything. Photographs aren't the only type of evidence you can use. Do you know what I mean? Anyway. It is easy to see all of the connections here between the Gen 2 penguins and these invading space penguins, but there are some differences that we need to clear up. Like I say, you know, you've got them beaks, and you can see that on the photographs of Gen 2 penguins, which, as I said, aren't, aren't the best sorts of evidence, but we will use them a little bit, you know, as it... Um, you can see that the beaks are black on the top and the bottom, but there is this there's a little line of red on the side. Now, the space penguins, as I said, did solely have black beaks, and... He, he, Claude, Mr. Edwards, let's, well, we don't, I don't know him personally, innit, so I'm gonna, well, Mr. Edwards for now, you know, we won't be too, uh, too familiar with him, because he's, uh, not here today. Now, he didn't notice that red from the distance he was observing, but we know that he was at, at the very most, he was 70 foot away, and we know that because he travelled through that 70 feet on initial sighting, through a field full of cows, but, just for the sake of argument, we're going to keep it at 70 feet, which is about 20 metres. Now, 
I would imagine, I'm going to go out on a hunch, that if you're listening to this show here about penguins, then you've probably been to a zoo at some point in your life, innit? Now, we've all been to zoos where we can probably see penguins from about 20 metres away. Now, personally, I'd find it a challenge to distinguish the colour in, in um, a, a penguin's beak, you know, that distance. It's probably all going to look like one colour, innit? And to prove a point, as a way of experiment, what I did was... I, uh, I went to the local the local shop where they, they print stuff out for you because I didn't have any ink. And I asked them to print out a photograph of a Gen 2 on A4 paper. Now, A4 paper, right, it's about it's about 30 centimetres long, 28 to 30 centimetres tall. And that's about a third of the height of a Gen 2 penguin. So I popped it just a little under 7 metres away. So proportionally, it seems similar. And I'll be dead honest, guys, I couldn't quite see the red on their beaks either. So the second problem was this green colour. But that can be rectified by observing Gen 2 behaviour, can't it? If we, if you remember before, that they're known to live in grassy areas. And as I stated earlier, they regularly move away once the grass has been trodden on. But penguins like to slide around on things. So maybe it's just grass stains on them, on the plumage. Just green, chlorof- is it chlorophyll? Is that what causes the stains from grass? And and that could be all it is, just grass stains on white feathers. And we know that they fucking, they like a shag in that. They're always having a roll around in the dirt, you know, fucking on each other's fucking backs and that. So the bellies are always going to be getting rubbed in the grass. Now, the grey, the grey in that, in that circumstance is probably just dirt as well. And it's difficult as well, as I said earlier, to, dif- to differentiate between grey and black at a distance of 70 feet. Also, at night time, a lot harder at night time and at a good distance. Now, because uh, Claude Edwards, Mr. Claude Edwards, was a good distance away, he couldn't actually engage these these penguins in hand-to-hand combat with, with um, you know, with, uh, these, these uh, we won't call them penguins, let's not assume. Well, he, he couldn't engage in hand-to-hand combat with these otherworldly beings. So what he did was he threw a stone at them, followed quickly by another. However... What happened then was the the space penguins only noticed the second as it bounced off the force field of their ship. Now, I put it to you, dear listener, that these penguins saw this as an offering from a more primitive species, like tribesmen would to a god in days gone by. Now, this situation went on to forge a tradition amongst the the Tuscumbian space penguins as they began to settle into their new homes on islands and the Antarctic Ocean, much in the same way that... uh, Christians and Catholics and that offer gifts at Christmas. It would also be a safe assumption that these space penguins have played some part in the Valentine's Day gift concept. Now we, that's as humans, not as earthlings, let's let's not go that far. We don't know if we are from Earth. There's a very good chance that we, we are in fact created within the moon in a in a cloning facility. But we're not we, we won't get into that this this week. We we've got the penguins to focus on. Now We do offer shiny things to potential mates on February 14th in the hopes that these people might tickle that sensitive part of our genitals with the tongs, you know. Whether you're a man or a woman, and whether you're a man or a woman that's into men or women, it doesn't matter, you know. That's that's the whole point of of February 14th, Valentine's Day. All around the world, uh, uh, somebody buys somebody that they like the look of. They they buy them something that they think is kind of shiny or that the other person might like, just in the hopes of maybe a gobble at bedtime. Do you know what I mean? Now, there is a possibility that the penguins knew of some of the other traditions on this planet as well and saw this offering as a sign of goodwill, although maybe a slightly perverse, you know, and, and they thought to themselves, you know what, I don't want out to do with this. I really don't want to shag this farmer bloke that's giving me stones on Valentine's Day. But still, you know... They, they saw it as what it was. It was a nice, kind gesture. It wasn't a threat of violence, luckily. Now, a few days prior to the Penguin's arrival, America had actually launched something called the Lunar Orbiter 3 at the moon. Now, it could be a safe assumption that these penguins came from our cold moon, because they like the cold, in order to investigate the origins of the orbiter, and more importantly, the intentions of the creatures that launched it. Because, you know, we've... We've either never been there or we've only ever been there once. And we may have never bumped into the penguins. The moon, it looks tiny, but it's probably fucking massive, especially if it's only got, you know, a group of a bunch, which is, what, five to ten penguins living on it, potentially. So what's the chance of ever bumping into them? You think about all the way you live. Think about the area where you live, right, and all of the people you know in the area and how often you can go to town, right, and not bump, not bump into any of those people. Now, imagine that's going on on the moon 
between about four or five American lads, however many it was, and probably some Russians that we're not told about that went there. And and they're trying to find a, a species of penguins less than a metre tall that hang around in groups of ten or less, and um, we don't even know exist. It's just the same. Now, luckily for mankind, though, the space penguins took Claude Edwards' uh, what would be assault as a sexual advance or a show of affection, and they decided they had to stay around on the planet in order to investigate a little bit. Now, what is not known is why they flew off to the east, yet managed to settle in the south. Now, we may never know what they did in between. Perhaps what they did was assist the British in manufacturing their very first all-British satellite. Now, was this how they ended up inhabiting the British-owned islands? Maybe. They ended their tour of Earth by assisting the South Africans with the world's first successful heart transplant, and that's why their population is concentrated in south of South Africa. These these are just some of the world-altering events that happened in the following months, though, after the initial sighting of the Tuscumbian space penguins. Now, I mentioned Christianity earlier with the Christmas gifts and that, and I would like to refer briefly to one of Jesus' parables. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but it was it was about a man who gave gifts to his servants or to his slaves or something for them to look after, and the first buried it, the second wasted it and pissed it up the wall, and the third invested it and gave back the initial gift and managed to keep some for himself. Now, that is what I propose the penguins have done with these pebbles in continuing their tradition. But let's have a song. This is My House by Dr. Syntax and Tom Carana. If you're enjoying this, right... Do you know what you might like? You might like a fucking bollock boy, mate, which is a little robot with mouse testicles in. Six quid on worldaroundyou.com. There's other stuff as well, you know, like mystery boxes and fucking things I've made out of rats and dead ducklings and that. So fucking give them a look, mate. The prices start at like fucking a quid for a, for a piece of fossilised shell. And then prices vary going up. You can also get shirts and that as well from there. But go and have a look, mate, worldaroundyou.com. But I'm guessing if you've found this, you already know about all the taxidermy. But still, you know, maybe maybe now's the time to treat your missus to a little mouse heart. You know, I, I, I don't know you, though. I can't tell you what to do. I'm just glad you're listening to the shows. Some of you obviously don't know because I can see how many people listen to the show, so I thought I'd let you know about my other show. I've got another podcast now called Truth Seek, and it's me and a comedian called Jimmy Bud, and we just we talk about different conspiracies. Um, if you uh, imagine this, except there's another person kind of reining me in and and keeping me kind of on track. And also cracking jokes as well. It's funny, mate. Yeah, Jimmy makes me laugh. I make Jimmy laugh. And hopefully it will make you laugh and all. So that's truth seeking. You'll probably be able to find it through one of the links underneath. Please give it a listen and go and give Jimmy a follow on Instagram and that. Let him know what you think of the shows. I'll let you crack on with this though, though, for now. Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. A quote from somebody that didn't like kebabs and flavoured yogurts. But... I think it can also be used when we think about the penguins. Now, if they have arrived here and helped us with some form of technological advancements throughout maybe the 1950s or whatever it was, then what do they have to gain by this? They they already potentially had the moon to themselves, at least the exterior of the moon, maybe not the cloning facility deep inside within it, but they at least had the exterior of the moon. Now, were they just lonely? Or is there the potential that there's something much more sinister afoot? Now, in my opinion, probably best not to risk it, innit? Whether the Gen 2 are second generation Tuscumbian space penguins or just a species with uncanny resemblances to them that evolved down here on Earth, they are a threat to both us and our planet. Now, as literal space invaders, they could possess knowledge needed to wipe out our own way of life, our, our very way of existence. Or they could simply use their perfectly positioned with... They've got no natural land predators where they live, these Gen 2 penguins, which just seems weird, uh, almost impossible. But these these perfectly positioned nesting spots, and they could multiply an army from, let's say, 600,000 strong, right, what, they've, what they seem to currently have, into multiples of millions. Now, I looked into the Gen 2 penguin gestation period, and it's about 34 days to incubate an egg. Now, that means that one of these space penguins could be possibly responsible for... Well, each of them could have been responsible for 541 offspring in the past 52 years. Uh, that's 
and this is from when I wrote the notes. So let's let's imagine this was I think this was two years ago I made these notes going off how 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 the the time where I felt like my head had broke. So let's say fifty four years at least five hundred and forty one. But we can probably bump that up a bit there to how many days in a year? Three hundred and sixty five days in a year. Thirty four days. Three hundred and sixty five divided by thirty four. That's fucking like what ten eggs with a couple days in between to fucking rest themselves. So an extra an extra twenty eggs. Let's let's call it an extra twenty eggs. They could have popped out there. So that's what five hundred and sixty odd offspring each in the past fifty four years. Now, with each of those being responsible for at least a few hundred of their own, up until like the more very recent ones where they, you know maybe they're only a couple of years old and they've only managed to have two or three offspring, that's if they are here to invade and keep on breeding. Now, now it does turn out that this increasing population is good for killer whales, or the the shockingly similarly coloured and and almost identical orca. Proving once and for all, right, you are what you eat, right? Because, you know, the, these are vet, these uh, the killer whales have been managing to eat these penguins when they go out to sea. And then they've become these murderous monsters that are hell-bent on also taking over the world. If you remember the crustacean frustration episode where we uh, discussed why whales are detrimental to the to the earth, to the to landmass, and why they're trying to erode the the coastal lines away. To in to in a, in a bid to do nothing more than damage old people's property values, who've managed to save up. They've, these old people have spent their whole lives working in order to be able to retire at the sea, just for the garden that they fell in love with thirty years ago. To now be nothing more than just a patio, just coming out of the back of the conservatory, because the whales won't stop moving around, fucking chasing these Tuscumbian space penguins around in the fucking seas, making waves and currents which erode the coastal lines. But is there a chance that whales may have just been the original animal on Earth, defending it against both krill and invading space penguins alike, whilst simultaneously destroying our habitat inch by inch? Whether you know that's true or not, they're, they're not the only species on Earth now, so by destroying the Gen 2, we could also damage killer whale pro populations and all, which in my eyes is definitely a win-win, innit? Um... Now, my suggestion to destroy the black and white enemy of Antarctica is to try and disrupt their economy. We could destabilise their entire economy by collecting smooth stones from the areas that they live and scratching them. Of course, now, this would be very time-consuming uh, as an activity, so we would need to plan it out strategically. Now, I propose that we could introduce billions of tonnes of rusty nails onto beaches, right? And, and that can help to cause the stones get scratched, thus rendering them worthless in the eyes of these colonising little bastards. Now, I predict that within ten years, their females will have completely stopped putting out, making all of the males amongst them a lot more agitated. Cracks will start to show in their society, and wars will break out amongst the testosterone-ridden, uh, testosterone-ridden uh, fucking menguins, right? Leading them to cull their own populace, turning the war on animals in our favour. And also by putting a load of rusty nails onto the beaches as well, that will stop the turtles going back into the water. If we could do it on all the beaches, to be fair, because if we fill all of the beaches with rusty nails and screws and fucking broken glass and that, obviously the glass can break back down into sand because all that's all glass is is just uh, like sand mixed with what water and heated up or something like that. Is it? I can't. I can't quite remember. But if we do that, then the turtles, when the turtles come and lay their eggs on the beaches, all the babies won't be able to get back into the water. And then the water levels of the seas will eventually go back down to where they used to be. This is the problem, guys. This is the problem with believing environmentalists. Environmentalists, like people like these ones that are fucking standing in streets and gluing themselves to roads and that. They just don't think. That's the problem, man. They don't think. If we was to go out to sea, right, in fucking shipping boats and kill all the fish... All the big fish, at least all the whales, the maybe not the sharks. The sharks they keep they keep the sharks and the killer whales because they're helping us out just for now, and then we could eventually poison their food supply later on and down the line. But if we kill most of the larger creatures, and when the ones that come out to lay eggs, like penguins, be it an emperor penguin or a Gen two penguin, or you know fucking turtles, green sea turtles, leatherback turtles, it doesn't matter what they are. Walruses, I bet walruses come out of sea to give birth. 
But once they've come out and we know they have, that's when we dump the nails. We dump the nails, make a make a line down the beach, like they would have done at Normandy with the fucking anti-tank devices. But except instead of it being massive rusty crosses that we put on a beach, like some form of what sounds like, when I say it like that, sounds like maybe a fucking, uh, what a racist mechanic might do. But I don't mean like that. I mean like it's it's like a three or four pronged cross, it's like an asterisk. An asterisk, a rusty asterisk, you know, that was an anti-tank device, not like a, not like a crucifix or out like that. We don't need to think about crucifixes, unless, of course, you want to buy a Jesus lizard, which is a baby lizard on a crucifix on a beanie from a website, worldaroundyou.com, in which case there's about 17 quid, and they'll get to you in about two or three weeks, and that's worldaroundyou.com there for a Jesus beanie. But without thinking about that, if we get all of these nails on the beach, we can probably... We, we can. And then when the big ones go into the sea, right, say a walrus then drags its fucking belly across the ground, you know, and getting some little cuts in there. I cut it. And then when it cuts it, it gets a bit of infection, mate. It gets tetanus. Now, a walrus with tetanus is perfect because it's going to slow it down. That's what it's going to do mostly. It's going to make it ill. It's going to slow it down because they're fucking heavy, aren't they, a walrus? Big mass and it's fucking deadly. But also, it's now bleeding, which means it's going to draw the sharks in. And, you know... Maybe it's going to fucking mean that it's not going to get back to feed its young, leaving it or risk to starve on the beach until that decides to go into the water and gets ripped apart by the nails. And eventually the walruses will either be forced to evolve, finally proving that dinosaurs were real, or they'll be fucking just fucking left to die. Or oh, they'll have to find a way to fucking give birth at sea, which probably won't be much cop for the walruses, but it will be good for shark populations. And then, you know, there's, we can find a way to eventually kill the sharks, maybe. I don't really want to put bleach in the water, in it, because, you know, I don't know how it mixes with the salt in there, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And also, you know, if we do increase sharks in all bodies of water, fucking bridge sails, mate, will go through the fucking roof. Let's have a song. This is Fight by Pharaoh Munch for Ian and Cypress Hill. Oh, just, just a minute, guys. I just wanted to, a little calm advert for you, a little calmer advert. And if you're, if you're like me, a pseudo-intellectual, what you might enjoy are my books. You've got uneducated guesses where I found a load of big words I don't know the meaning to and then tried to work out what they mean by breaking down the syllables and doing illustration for each one. You've got How to Date an Antique Table, A Lover's Guide, which is a book that will tell you how to get your end away with an antique table, complete with how to find an antique table, where to take an antique table on a date, like you could take it dogging, you could take it to the cinema, you could take it for a picnic, and some chat-up lines as well, like, I know I'm drunk, but you look absolutely canted. And even then, you got some pictures in the back of some of me taxidermy and that as well. And you've got my third book, More You Know, which is a book of very well-researched fake facts, just a book of lies, basically, and some of them were um, suggested, as in topic-wise, were suggested by some of the people from TikTok. So you might even, if you took part in that, you might even have your username on the first couple pages of that book. Anyway, if you, uh, like I say, if you're enjoying these, you might like the books, and you can get access to the books through Patreon or through my website. I'll fucking let you crack on with the show, guys. Now, look, I know that out of context, right, my research write-up might seem a little bit aggressive, but it's all there, isn't it? All the facts that we need about penguins, both terrestrial and extraterrestrial. But now we have other people and all who are interested in reality. Now, for argument's sake, we're going to call these people scientists, not scientists, but scientists. And, and they're interested in the penguins and their off-worldly natures as well. So it's nice to know that I was at the forefront of yet another investigation, which I'm never going to get credit for because no one's ever seen the, the notes of this. And it's, I'm not even pretending that I wrote this ages ago. I did. Now, the main reason that these scientists believe that penguins may be from outer space is because of a chemical found in the ship, their, their excrement. But that might be only because a, a scientist has no interest in history and has to only assess through the eyes of a scientist. They'll completely disregard the first-hand historical accounts of the Tusquambian Tus space penguin um, and Claude Edwards and the possibly related scientific breakthroughs in the following years, and they'll only rely on this discovery. Now, some scientists, the bad scientists, they'll try to claim that the discovery of these scientists of phosphine in a penguin shite isn't actually proof of the penguin's alien heritage, citing things that there's a there's a, like things like you know there was a, there was a type of um, a very specific type of bacteria which I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of that creates phosphine and saying that it also exists inside the guts of a badger. Now, 
that's that in my eyes that's not science that's that's one person trying to trying to say that this what this other person has said isn't true that's nothing more than playground tactics that's bickering amongst adults that just nonsense but there are a few things that may have not been considered now for millennia there's been an intergalactic war going on for our very for our very lives for the for the, for the for our, for our very existence, you know, between light and dark, the reptilians and palladians, but also, some believe there's been a war between the reptilian races and the tall whites, with the tall whites coming from the inside of Venus in it to help guide humans and earthlings in their little battle between the people of Earth and the reptilians. You may remember from the tall whites episode that we did all that time ago, with um, Val Valiant Thor and all that, if, if we did even go into Val Valiant Thor, if not, I'll make a note of Val Valiant Thor and we'll have an episode on Val Valiant Thor. I've definitely got notes on him in my pile of fucking papers, especially from the time when I was writing up all this penguin stuff. Now, what we got to think here is that these, these tall whites come from the inside of Venus and they've come here to help guide humans and earthlings in the, the subversive... Um, battle if you like between the people of earth and the reptilians but a lot of people right seem to think that posh people and rich people are in fact lizard people in disguise and some rich people right do you know what they do they hunt badges in it with many politicians campaigning for a cull on badges in you know let's say in the past 10 years now saying oh they spread tb and they've got all this what if it's because they've got a source of phosphine in them and they're thinking to themselves oh there's a scumbian space penguins mate well they wouldn't to the aliens outside of the planet they're not going to be called the tuscumbian space penguins they're probably going to have another name and it might read something more like or something like that but we can't call them like that because that makes no sense to us so we're going to still call them the tuscumbian space penguins but for the for the sake of helpfulness and just for the like readability if you like of the episode the uh the clang would translate as just penguins but because to us they were penguins from outer space found in tuscumbia they are now known as the tuscumbian space penguins i understand that that might be difficult to follow but we're not going to call them the clang because it again would make no sense now if it's because of the phosphine that's present within the badger's gut and that's why they're killing them because maybe the penguins need it to survive or they need it for something. Maybe it's because maybe they can mix the phosphine with the shiny smooth pebbles and create weaponry. I don't, I don't know, like fucking like fucking green goblin grenades or something. Maybe that's that's why that's where that could come from. I'm, I'm not too sure. Again, it's not something I could look into because I'm I'm not a fucking weapons manufacturer. Do you know what I mean? I'm not I'm not a chemist. I'm 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 not a I, I am not I am not a uh I'm 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 not very well versed in how to make weaponry out of phosphine and smooth pebbles. I'm not and I'm 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 happy to hold my hands up and say that to you, you know. But maybe the 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 trying to the, the, the reptilians and that might be trying to eradicate a rival species or Maybe, maybe, maybe the badges are from Venus as well with the penguins. In, but what if it's nothing like that? What if it's not because they're trying to make phosphine bombs out of stones and the reptilians are trying to stop that? And what if it's not because the badges are also from Venus? Because that would also imply that the killer whales are from Venus. But we don't believe that. We believe that maybe the killer whales were maybe one of the most original species of creature on Earth. So we, we can't think that because that goes against everything we've been saying in this past hour. But what if it's what if it's more... Again, more sub. Is, is it? Is the word sub subversive? So where they're trying to like look up here, look up here as I'm waving, and then kick us in the shins. What if they're just trying to get us used to and normalise the idea of wiping out something that's also black and white and very, very rarely seen by people, just like a penguin, right? Because not many people see a penguin out in you know fucking out and about. You see them on telly all the time, but not out and about. You might see a fox, but you very rarely see a badger when you're out and about. You what what? is quite actually a thing is you will actually see more dead badgers than live badgers now what if the reptilians go around and are with, dressed as these rich people the posh people they kill a badger they go a bit of badger baiting you know they're fucking <whistles> like that by the badger holes and then club them over the head much like you would a seal which maybe you know that's maybe that's why they were over there we we get told oh stop clubbing seals don't go over there clubbing seals but they were never clubbing seals mate never unless there was black and white seals maybe that's what they were doing they were killing them but they were actually over there killing the gen 2 penguins but they, they lied to us and say it's seals because that's for some reason to the general public maybe more palatable than the idea of someone beating a penguin to death which 
it was a great game on the internet where you, the penguin used to jump off a fucking, I think it was called Bloody Pingu, a penguin would jump off a cliff and then you had to hit it with a baseball bat, which was a great game, but probably funded by the reptilians. Now, th- th- like I'm saying, the black and white creatures of the badgers are very much like penguins in colour, but these these scientists that go on about bacteria and badgers might not be considering solid phosphine at all, or liquid phosphine, because as far as I'm aware, it's only the gaseous form of it on Venus that we're aware of. We don't know if there was a solid form on Venus or if there was a liquid form on Venus. We're only aware of the gaseous form, which I think is emitted through the pig- the, the, the penguin shit as well. Now, I did read somewhere that there was some phosphine-producing penguins living in the Falklands, which is a place that some of the posh people of Britain, right, sent some of the poorer people of Britain to take part in a war. And that might be something to do with the penguins. Now, it makes you wonder, as well, if a lot of other wars have been fought and and, and they were just a front for some form of fight against other worldly creatures. Maybe it's the reptilians trying to stop the Venetians from forming a base. Anyway, let's have a song. This is I Declare War by Pace One. All right, mate, just a little, quick little advert for myself. Uh, if you're enjoying this, fucking join the Patreon, mate, if you can. Uh, for a little as a, a quid, two quid, three quid, tenner, whatever you want to throw on there, you get the same stuff either way. Obviously, it's nicer if you put, like, three quid on rather than a quid, because I'll only get, like, 75p out of the quid. But still, it's 75p more than what I'm getting now. The um, it's, it's just you get access to video versions of these, discounts for canvases and maybe some other little bits off my website, and you get access to the PDF versions, that's the digital download versions of my books. Anyway, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you get back onto your show. Maybe, right, maybe the reptilians that want to take over the world are trying to terraform the whole planet using vehicles. Maybe we call them reptilians because we believe that they're hard-skinned and cold-blooded, but oil and metal could easily be seen as hard and cold as well. So what if there is an equivalent of a, of a robot, right, the, the reptilians, and they're using cars to terraform our planet to be able to live here? Whilst the Venetians or the Venusians, uh, I think it'd probably be uh, Venusians because Venetians is probably people from a very particular part of uh, Italy, and I'm now worried that I've been saying that wrong the whole episode, which is really fucking annoying. But the Venusians might, they might be able to use what we view as penguins, except now, now, to make it clear. I'm I'm not suggesting that the the perception filters put around the earth by the grey aliens. I'm not suggesting that they make us see the penguins. I'm suggesting here that the what we consider to be reptilians, we're just using our base of we're just comparing them to the lizards that we have seen on our planet, seeing that they're um, cold blooded and and very hard to the touch, like skin wise, just like a robot is. Now they could actually be some form of cyborg or. Uh, synthetic creature made up of machine parts and not the reptilians now the venusians could be a very more natural thing but in the same way that the reptilians may be using cars and lorries and that's why there's this big push now for hgv drivers because they're like right people are starting to ride bikes which is terrible for the world but except in from an environmentalist point of view where it's good for the world but that's because maybe an environmentalist only ever wants to disrupt the economy because they're trying to disrupt the world and now and which has been proven by them sitting in streets and gluing themselves they're just disrupting things that's why they want more people riding bicycles so everyone has to move around slowly and doesn't travel as far not because it saves on emissions but this has got nothing to do with what we're talking about maybe we'll cover this in another show now the reptilians make something that resembles what they view as life. Now, they may view as life mechanical parts, moving parts, machinery, kind of similar to like when people describe like the Archons and the things like that, those sorts of creatures, and they, they can't create something new. So they're making these things through machine parts and that we see them as cars and we use them as cars because they are cars, but their their main priority is to terraform the planet, expelling chemicals out, whilst also pretending to be useful. Like, in the same sense of, like, people sign a contract with the devil, it seems great to them, but there's always a downside. That would be the downside with the with the, with the the uh, the idea of the fucking extra-dimensional beings kind of thing as well. All ties together. Now, what I'm suggesting is the Venusians, in the same way that the reptilians can create cars, the Venusians can create what we see as penguins, except from living matter. I don't know how they do it, I'm not a Venusian, but that's all I'm suggesting here, right? It's just that penguins are just a different type of terraformer, 
right? Uh, except these terraformers can make more of themselves immediately. Uh, as we re- can you remember from earlier in the episode, about 564, did we agree on 562? Uh, they can make another another amount of them in a lifetime, and each of them can make another 500 and odd in a lifetime, dependent on how long a penguin lives. But cars can't do that. Computers can potentially do that, because a computer can eventually make its own robot if you program it to, and then that robot can then produce more robots which can produce more of those robots think of a car producing manufacturer i think i'm pretty sure that's how i'm pretty sure that's where car producing comes from you know henry t ford initially had people doing it but now the, what they do is they buy an empty warehouse and they, they build they get a couple of people to build one of those um metal yellow bright yellow metal arms and then they program a machine and they pull the conveyor belt, and then this yellow metal arm will then be programmed to make more yellow metal arms, and then they get a couple people to program another robot, which takes these metal arms and places them in the ground, but then the people don't need to do it anymore, because now the two robots are making the yellow arms and planting them in the ground like fucking metal trees, metal terraforming trees, metal terraforming producing trees would be more appropriate. And then we've got these robots creating this factory. And then maybe a person comes in and says, oh, we need to make this type of car. So here's how to make this type of car. But then they make a computer system, an algorithm, let's call it, which imports stuff. And then they, they, that computer algorithm, the AI, whatever you want to call it, is importing these things to the factory. And then the factory is producing these cars. And then eventually, all that we're left with is robots continuously producing terraforming vehicles for the reptilian races that we can't even see and can't even prove if they're real or not. So then it's happening. It's happening without us. They no longer need us once that starts to happen more. Now, I'm suggesting that the Venusians were smarter and they were able to do it with penguins quicker but maybe less effective because they're penguins and they're a lot smaller than your average car. And I would also imagine that a 90 centimetre tall Tuscumbian space penguin is probably a hell of a lot lighter than even a two-stroke engine, let alone a proper car engine. So just just as something to think about, you know. Now, I've never heard of technology like this, as I say, but this is what separates me from your other scientists and makes me more of an actual scientist, you know. I mean, I was right about the penguins being from another planet, so why can't I be right about this? Now, one thing you have to consider about a penguin is that they live in a landmass with no obvious predator, yet scientists want to make us believe that penguins are stupid, right? Saying things that, like, when a plane flies overhead, that they just stare at it and then roll onto their backs as they're watching it, and they fall over because they're idiots. Now, to me, that's always been them just disguising themselves. Like, the bellies of a penguin tends to be white, doesn't it? So, They'll blend in better to predators if they're living in snow. If, say, a big predator's flying overhead. Now, what's a big predator in the eyes of a Venusian? A reptilian, which would be what? A dragon. In our eyes, a dragon. But realistically, because the reptilians are creating mechanical things that do it, the dragons are actually just planes. So a plane goes overhead, the Venusians see this and go, oh my god, it's a decept... Um, um, sorry, oh my god, it's a reptilian. And they're like, oh, it's... And then the penguins lie onto their backs showing only the whites and these little black beaks, uh, with potentially with red lines, but if the Tuscumbian space penguins, just, just with a general black beak, and then it flies over, and then the, the dragon, or the plane, if you like, when that observes the ground, just sees little black dots, if it can even see them at all, but they're probably too small to see. And we know, actually, no, we know that these beaks are too small to see, because Claude Edwards couldn't even see the fucking beaks properly from 70 feet away. So a plane flying overhead isn't going to see that it's just going to see all you know just white on the ground because these penguins are disguising themselves it's not because they're stupid at all you know they we also you know it's just it's just just, this is what i don't get about scientists man that's that's not it's not right it doesn't make sense and which is why you know what 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 will they think of fucking you know like helicopters, they're scared of planes, but helicopters and and cars—they're all reptilian technology. And and helicopters are, are made from similar materials, and they react the same. So, you know, do they do it when a fucking albatross flies over? Probably not, because an albatross could be just made by the Venusians, and they know that they're aware of that. Maybe the guy that came out with you know birds are drones—that's not exactly what he meant. He meant birds, birds, birds are clones. They're all clones of each other. We'd fucking—he just spelt it wrong and then thought fuck. I'd, he'd written it, you know, in, in handwriting, and uh, which looks a lot like CL. When I write CL, it looks a lot like a D. And someone looked at it going, birds are dones. And like, what are you on about? No, not birds. Are, birds aren't dones. Birds are, birds are drones. Yeah, birds are drones. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And the guy's thinking, fuck. 
I've already designed all the t-shirts with the cloning facilities in fucking the moon. Right, what I'll do is I'll, I'll fucking, I'll leave that and I'll just stick with this birds of drone stuff, but... Now, as Earthlings, right, we're getting lost again, but as Earthlings, what we do is we plan to throw James Webb into space, right, and send it to like, have a look for aliens in the universe. But many UK scientists, right, actual scientists, appear to have gone on record to say that a lot of them already know that there is alien life out there. Now, myself included, an honorary British scientist, not a scientist, but a scientist... And and that's um, that's probably all we've got time for, guys. Later on, we've got a little bit of gym. We'll mix it, I think. And, and tomorrow, we will hopefully be back with truth seeking. Or fucking see us in a bit, guys. Thanks for listening, man. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time because it's it's over. And hopefully, you're listening to all of these one after the other or on repeat. Maybe the same episode on repeat. But fucking leave us a review if you can, mate. Fucking share it with a mate. Send it to your nana. I don't mind where you send it to, but if you get more people listening to it, thank you. If you did enjoy it, though, uh, fucking join the Patreon, mate. www.patreon.com slash world around you. There'll be a link in one of the links in the description, I would imagine, of the one you're listening to. Uh, you can join for a quid, a fiver, you know, and you get access to all the video versions of these. Uh, you Normally you'll end up about four or five episodes ahead as well through Patreon. And you get access to some of my books as well. And a little discount code for some of the canvases as well. But even if you don't join that, fucking thanks for listening to it, mate. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully. Here's the next one.